Hello, and welcome to Europa Universalis 4, the world's jankiest, most complicated game that uh, you can almost guarantee guides will be out of date for by the time they go live. Um, I have played this game for quite a few years. I'm an intermediate player. I'm not amazing, uh, but I have taught several people to play, and uh, someone uh, recently got the game on my suggestion, and they were like, ooh, this is intimidating. So I thought I'd just do a little uh, guide on all of the menus and all of the uh, stuff that's going on so that you are equipped to get started. I'm going to do a series of videos about different menus. Uh, this first one's probably going to be quite a lot longer than the next few, uh, and I'll probably do one about, like, my process when I start a new country and, like, get set up to start playing, but uh, we'll see how I go. But this is the main menu. Um, I, you, sorry, just hit single player and it opens up this. You can see every country that's playable in the world. You can select a different start date if you want. You can load save games if you want. It also shows you all of the uh, expansions that you have available. You can change the starting date if you feel like it. Um, but pretty much everyone starts at 1444. Uh, all of these 1444 starts the same, it just like teleports you over to the other side of the map, basically, and suggests different countries. So uh, these ones down here are like, these are fun ones for you to try, and they are fun ones for you to try, and uh, it's mostly pretty good advice. Um, but we're just gonna pick some random country, let's say... Uh, Venice, let's say Venice. Barely ever played as Venice. Um, and so once you select a country, you get a bunch of information about it over here. Don't worry about it too much. Uh, the ideas are what kind of makes you your, your own unique country uh, for the most part, um, and they get unlocked throughout the game. Um, so especially, uh, th that can be a reason to choose a country over another one. Um, it gives you some other information about how big you are and what kind of diplomatic relations you have. Your leader, your tech level, government type and religion. Don't worry about it too much. Um, we'll get into more information about all of these things as we go. You can also make a custom nation, which I haven't played around with that much, but uh, it is fun. You can make a random new world if you feel like it. I'm not going to show you that right now. And you can just randomly select a nation, so it's going to suggest a whole lot of different ones, just whichever. And this can be fun if you don't know which, uh, which thing to start as. Um, but we're going to start as Venice, um, and we're going to hit play. You can choose normal mode or Iron Man mode. Um, Iron Man mode you can't uh, reload, basically. Uh, normal mode you can save and reload as much as you want. I'd suggest playing on normal mode while you're finding your feet. Okay, so here we are. Um, every country when you start off will pop up with uh, this box. Uh, it gives you a bunch of information about the country. The country tab is just kind of like mostly flavor, gives you a bit of context. Religion tells you about your religious mechanics. There are a lot of different religions. We'll get into that a bit more later as well. Ditto government. There's a lot of different uh, government types. Or actually a republic, which is... The, the main one is monarchy. You're going to be playing as a monarchy most of the time, but it won't matter too much uh, for the sake of this video. And then environment. Um, this tells you what's going on in sort of your continent or whatever. Um, and for us, the, we're in Europe, which is dominated by the Holy Roman Empire. Again, you'll get to know all of this stuff um, after a couple of games. You'll know, like, oh, I'm near the HRE, or I'm near the Ottomans, or whatever it is. So here we are. We're Venice. Um, this is our country. These are all of our provinces. Um, there's a whole lot of different menus in this game. And for this video, I'm going to start off by telling you everything that's on this basic screen, the, the main interface, and I'm also going to take you through the main menu. So that's going to take quite a while. Um, but we'll get there. Um, and then for the next video, I'll show you the production interface and the overlays, something like that. So here we are as Venice. Uh, we can see we've got troops, we've got provinces, uh, we've got boats um, that can you know sail out if we want them to. Uh, and we can see provinces that surround ours, right? So we can see, like, for example, Bologna has 5,000 troops here, but we can't see what's going on in Genoa. It's too far away for us. It's grayed out. And then there's also, like, a hard limit to where our maps extend. So we don't know what's going on in India, for example. We just, like, don't even know what the countries there are like. You can also, on this screen, you can see there's a fort here. Um, and yeah, a bunch of other stuff. We'll get into province view another time as well. Uh, you've also got all of your main currencies and resources here, which I'll go over in a sec. 
uh, your outliner, which gives you a bunch of general information about your country, date, speed control, so you can pause and unpause, and um, you can use the plus or minus keys on your keyboard, or you can whoop, uh, just click these buttons to speed it up and slow it down, change a bunch of other stuff here. Uh, and then down in the bottom right is your view, your, your mini-map, obviously, uh, and your different views that you can, like, have overlays, sorry, overlays, that's what they're called, um, for more information of specific sorts. The basic default one is political, which is the second one here with the little flag, so if you're ever like, oh god, I don't know, I can't click anything, what's, what's going on? Um, just go back to the political map mode. Uh, under here there's some other advanced things, uh, I'll show you those, but the main one is the escape menu and the ledger, which gives you a whole, way too much information, uh, and, and I'll get to that at some point. Uh, down here there's some other things, for example, Pope view uh, and Holy Roman Empire view, uh, which uh, I probably won't actually cover in these videos, that's like slightly deeper, but if you need to know where they are, they're there. And then factions is a, a republic uh, thing that, again, uh, is probably a little too specific for the guide that I'm going for now. Up here you have alerts, for example, you can convert provinces to Catholic. You can click on it, it'll take you to the relevant screen, or if you're like, I don't care about converting people right now, just right click it and it'll disappear. Okay, I think that's pretty much everything. Oh, uh, you click on troops to select them, you can also like box select, right click to move them around, left click to whatever, you can stop them, uh, there's a halt button, whatever. Controlling troops again and warfare, that's a whole other thing. That's, that's I probably won't make videos about that because again, as with trade, uh, trade in Europe Universalis is a, a dark magic only accessible to wizards of the fourth circle of hell. Uh, and and uh, the same is true of combat mechanics. So we probably won't get into that in too much detail. But uh, anyway, there you go. That's the basic screen. So let's get into these resources. Uh, we'll cover them in a lot more detail, but there's a bunch of different ones. Uh, so you might think of them as currencies or statistics or whatever, but for the most part, they're, they're like, yeah, resources that you can spend. Um, the most important ones, pretty much, are these three, which are called power monarch points or monarch power, uh, known by the player base as mana. And there are three types. There's admin, diplo, and military mana. And you use them for a bunch of different stuff. Um, in this game you kind of play as like a country, you're not playing as an individual, and so these are like your country's ability to influence things. So just for example, you use military power to recruit generals, use all of these to develop technology in these different fields, um, you spend diplomatic points on making alliances, and whatever, whatever. There's a bunch of different stuff. Uh, Admin power, this might be a little contentious, but I don't think it is very contentious. Admin power is basically the most valuable resource in the game because you use it for a bunch of really important things. Main ones being technology and ideas, which again, we'll get into that in more detail. Uh, another of which is, um, it's called coring a province, which basically is when you conquer a province from someone else and then you want to be like, no, this is really Venetian land. You make it a core province and that costs admin power. So it's extremely valuable. Uh, number two most valuable is probably military power because this is a fighty fight game, uh, lots of wars and having good generals and good troops and good military technology and um, advanced military ideas uh, all cost military power and a bunch of other stuff like um, blowing up castles, for example, a bunch of stuff. Uh, so it's extremely valuable. And you can see with all of these, uh, you're getting a different amount each month, and we'll kind of go into that a bit more in a second. Uh, and there's also a maximum, so you can, at the moment, we can only keep 999 of each of these saved. So uh, you can get up to a maximum, and you should spend it if you're at the maximum. Okay, so that's the that's the mana points, the, the monarch points. Next is ducats, aka gold, or money. Um, money is good. You want money. Um, it's a very valuable resource because it can indirectly buy most of these other things. Um, that said, it comes and goes, so, you know, spend it um, if you're making enough that you can. Next is manpower, which is fairly self-explanatory. It's how many soldiers you have available. Um, and that, it costs, a, so you can see it's 7k. That's actually like 7 units, so each unit is 1,000 troops, so it costs 1,000 manpower to build one 1k unit which again is the smallest one, with a couple of unimportant exceptions. Uh, 
also if they take damage, right? So like if we go into a battle and then say 500 of Bergamo's first regiment die, they'll need 500 troops from our manpower pool to um, like recover their losses. And the same is pretty much true for sailors, right? Except for boats. So um, each boat costs a certain number of sailors to build, and then they cost sailors each month that they're out doing stuff to like replenish it. So you can see we've got, uh, and there's maximums for both of these. And um, manpower is very important. Sailors is like moderately important if you're a naval nation and otherwise, you know, don't worry about it too much. Stability, extremely valuable. Um, it does a bunch of stuff. It goes from minus three to plus three. So it feels a bit less like a currency than for example, gold or uh, the mana points. It feels a bit more like a statistic, which I think is kind of what they want it to feel like. It's um, as it sounds like a measurement of your country's stability. So high stability means less rebels. It means better manpower recruitment. It means better tax income, all sorts of stuff. Um, low stability equals more rebels and less other stuff. Um, and there are various ways to gain and lose stability, but stability also costs admin power um, and it costs more the more you have. So the third uh, stability is the most expensive one. Um, and that's another reason that admin power is one of the most valuable things is because you can get stability with it and you'll get pop-up events that will like offer you stability or other stuff and often the thing that offers you stability will be the right choice. Not always, but often. Corruption, corruption's bad. Uh, it's not a huge deal for the most part though. Um, it costs you money basically is how to think of it. More corruption costs you money to get rid of. Prestige is kind of what it sounds like, but it just sort of generally affects a whole lot of stuff. As it says here, prestige affects many things, but primarily how likely other nations are to accept our proposals and how likely it is that our royal marriages will result in personal unions. And you can see there's a bunch of very specific effects there as well. Uh, Prestige trends towards zero, so if, 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 for the most part. So if you're negative in prestige, it'll trend upwards. Uh, if you're positive in prestige, it'll trend downwards. And the higher or lower you are, the faster it will trend in that direction. So if you're at 100 prestige, which is the maximum, um, you'll be losing a lot every year. Whereas if you're at like 8.9, as we are, you're only losing a little bit each year. Okay, Republican tradition is here because we're a republic. But if we were pretty much any other government and honestly maybe I should switch to another government for the sake of this because they are quite rare let's do that okay so here we are I've switched over to Tyr Connell a tiny little country here in the north of Ireland uh, you can see we're much smaller than uh, Venice who were playing as before and you know we can't even see what's going on in Venice anymore because we you know, switched uh, switched over to Tyr Connell uh, and so we're no longer a, a republic, we're now a monarchy. And so monarchs have legitimacy. And um, uh, legitimacy and republican tradition represent basically how much people respect your government. And when it's low, you tend to get uh, different types of rebels. And as you can see, effects from your current legitimacy reduces rebels, increases uh, diplomatic reputation, all sorts of stuff. Uh, next up is power projection, which again, kind of what it sounds like. You get it from winning battles, from taking provinces from people, from insulting them, uh, and from embargoing your rivals, uh, and a whole lot of other, well, a few other things. But, um, and it has sliding effects, so you can see these ones with the following effects. Global trade power, morale, blah, blah, blah. So they scale relative to how much out of 100 your power projection is. Um, but then there are also static levels as well. So if you have at least 25 power projection, you gain a free leader without upkeep, which probably doesn't matter to you at all, dear viewer. And the one that is important is if you have 50, you get plus one of each monarch power, which as I mentioned is very good on top of all of those like sliding things of prestige, uh, legitimacy, morale, and so on. So power projection is really valuable. You'll tend to just accrue it throughout the course of a game. So like you rarely have to like actively think about it. There are a couple of things that you can do like embargoing your rivals, which we'll get to that, don't worry. Um, that it's worth doing just to kind of have it there that doesn't cost you anything. But like for the most part, don't sweat it about power projection or PP. <laughs> Next, you've got merchants, colonists, diplomats, and missionaries. These are dudes that you can go and send to do those different jobs. I kind of already showed you the merchant view to a certain extent. You can send merchants to different parts of the, the world. Colonists, we don't have any, but if we did, we could, you know, colonize North America, which is a big part of the EU for uh, gaming experience. 
um, diplomats, which you can also see over here. Oh, as, as you can also see the merchants over here. I've got one free. The other one's collecting a little bit of money. Um, uh, diplomats you can send over to talk to other countries. And uh, again, I'll show you more of that in a second. Ditto missionaries used to convert provinces to your religion sense and then one last thing which is sort of not super important but uh well for a total beginner like i assume you are dear viewer um you have these ages so the game starts off in the age of discovery uh there are four ages discovery reformation absolutism and revolutions and if you ever get to the age of revolutions you know good on you most people stop playing somewhere around reformation or absolutism and just start a new game uh, and each era, each age, has a, a bunch of um, goals, and if you complete them, you start getting splendor. You can spend splendor on each of these abilities, which tend to be extremely powerful. I'm not going to go into them, but you'll get a little drop down alert when you can buy one. And if you fulfill three of them, you can start a golden era, which has a bunch of really good effects. You only get one golden era per game, so if, like most people, you only play a relatively short game through the Age of Discovery and maybe some of Reformation, um, you might just want to take it as soon as you can get it. It lasts 50 years, I'm pretty sure, which is quite a while. Um, but if you're playing a longer game, you might want to consider waiting until later and getting an end game advantage over some of your opponents who got theirs right at the start. Uh, but again, that's a little bit deep for now. Um, don't worry about it too much, but you can mouse over and see the, the, uh, the, the um, information condensed as well. Oh, there's a couple more things. There's the Great Powers tab here, which just shows you the eight most powerful nations and how you rank compared to them. So Tier Connell, we only have one province. We've got a total of five development. And Ming, uh, who we can't see right now, but they're like China, basically, um, is quite large. And Hegemons is a late game mechanic that you don't have to worry about. But uh, it, it, a fun part of the game is slowly working your way up onto the Great Powers list and then up the Great Powers list. So um, that is relevant sometimes, and you can use this information to figure out how hard or easy it will be to become one. Uh, there's also the Government Reforms tab, which I'll show you more about. Uh, I don't know why there's like this... like. <sighs> A very convenient button for this one thing whereas everything else is like hidden behind i mean it's also hidden behind a million other menus but it's kind of a relatively small part of the game uh, but anyway basically this ticks up over time and and you can get like tiered buffs that change your country fairly significantly sometimes um you'll get a drop down alert about it so you don't have to like keep an eye on it too much but if you need to it's there and then we get to sort of, yeah, then there's all of the overlays, which again, I'll talk about them another time, as I will the production interface. Um, today, we're going to try and cover all or maybe just most of these tabs here um, in the main menu. So with that in mind, let's get started. Hey, everyone, it's me from the future here. Just dropping in to say that this video is long enough, so I'm actually going to split it into two. The next one will cover the main menu. And then I'll continue as planned doing the production interface and overlays. Catch you next time. Bye.